Okay, this assignment is flip 10, so make sure your pencil is sharpened or your pen is ready and you've got your notebook out, and we'll start right in with some vocabulary for the next unit. Leave space between each of these to write some definitions. The first two words are actually the same word. I'm going to start with the second one. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word, and it means anointed one, one who has had oil poured on his or her forehead. That word is often applied to Jesus. A lot of students, if I ask them what Messiah means, would blurt out, it means Savior. It doesn't. It had three distinct connotations, and I'd like you to jot these down in ancient Israel. Priests were anointed with oil. That was how they were commissioned. Prophets were anointed with oil. That's how they were given their office by another prophet. And kings were anointed. So the term Messiah has a lot of flexibility to it. It could refer to a priest. It could refer to a prophet or it could refer to a king. So obviously, as we talk about Samuel being a prophet, he could be seen as a messiah. We talk about Samuel anointing Saul as the first king. So Saul could be a messiah. And when you think about that Jesus guy, you might wonder, is he a prophet? Is he a priest? Is he a king? Why is it that his followers would ask him and other people would ask if he was the Messiah? What did they mean by that? And when we get to first century Palestine and we talk about some of the different groups that existed in the time of Jesus, they had different expectations for what a Messiah would be like or what a Messiah would do. But that's the term they applied to Jesus. Most of the early Christian writings were not written in Hebrew. They were actually written in Greek. And the Greek word that was used to translate Messiah was Christos, or Ho Christos, the Christ. So Christ means anointed one. It is the Greek version of it. And the term Christ, a lot of students or a lot of people think it was Jesus' last name. Hi there, I'm Joseph Christ, this is my wife Mary Christ, and hey, Jesus Christ, get over here! It is not his last name, it's a title for him, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Anointed One. And in the British tradition, at least, when a baby is baptized, they talk about the baby being christened. Um, that part of the baptism ritual is actual, uh, actually oil being placed on the child. Uh, those of you who have been baptized in the Christian tradition, whether you are a boy or a girl, when you were baptized, the priest took sacred chrism, the same oil that's used in anointing priests, and put it on your forehead and said, you are anointed as priest, prophet, and king. And that is the same oil and the same anointing that is repeated in confirmation for those who are baptized as babies or young children, so that you are rechristened, if you will. So again, the terms Christ and Messiah, these are questions that students sometimes mix up on the tests. Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed one, and Christ is the Greek word. I don't know if it helps much, but Crisco oil um, comes to mind when I think of the word Christ. The other word that I'd like to define right now is theocracy. We've talked about theology and um, the study of God. We've talked about a theophany, the dramatic manifestations of God, and we'll talk about theodicy later. But theocracy, if you look at the end of it, ocracy, and think about words that you know that end in ocracy, the one that hopefully jumps to mind is democracy. We have a government which is ruled by the people, the demos. So, krasi means rule by, and theo means God. So, a theocracy is any government by God, or any religiously um, oriented government. 
So the modern day state of Iran is often called a theocracy. Um, some people seem to think that the United States should be run as a Christian theocracy. But in Israel, the idea of theocracy was the idea that um, God was ultimately the ruler of the Israelites. It was the job of the king to do the administration of the nation, to rule the army, to collect taxes and things like that, and that the uh, way in which the king was kept in check, uh, kind of like checks and balances here in the United States, was that the prophet was the person who appointed the king and corrected the king if the king did wrong, and if necessary, fired the king. So um, Israel's theocracy was a partnership between the prophet and the king, and sometimes that was a warm and fuzzy um, relationship, and sometimes not so much. So we'll talk about, if we haven't already, uh, Saul being anointed by Samuel, and then Samuel deciding to fire Saul and anoint a new king. Uh, since we're on the uh, topic of anointing, I thought I would make a little jump into the book of Psalms, a very brief little psalm, Psalm 133. How good it is and pleasant when brothers dwell as one. It is like fine oil on the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has decreed a blessing, life forevermore. And this psalm might seem a little bit odd to us because the idea of pouring fine oil over our head, letting it run down our beard, or letting it run into the collar of our clothing, and how soothing and wonderful it feels to just pour oil over one's head, is not really a modern American experience. But for the Israelites, when the king was anointed, or when the priest was anointed, or the prophet, they would pour the oil over their head, and it would shine on their face, and they would look different. And um, it was even just a general cosmetic that if you lived in the Sea of Galilee area where it was windy, you would put oil on your head and use that to slick down your hair because you had not invented dep or gel or mousse or the um, kinds of things we use to hold our hair together. So again, um, this vision of a community at peace where is like smooth oil that's just running down your beard. Um, nice little footnote there, oil was used at the consecration of the high priest. Okay, I'll throw out a couple more things for you. Some of these places are actually on the map that you are going to be tested on, and um, I'm also going to have a section of the test where I'm going to ask you to identify what's important about each of these places. So I'll start on the left-hand side. You should have these in your notes already. Mount Sinai is obviously where the Israelites make the covenant with God after they leave Egypt. Moses goes up on the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments and establishes the covenant between the Israelites. The Israelites wander through the desert for 40 years and then at Mount Nebo, on the very brink of the Promised Land, Moses climbs to the top of Mount Nebo. He looks over the Promised Land, into the Promised Land, and there he dies, and then Joshua takes over. Uh, Mount Tabor appeared in the story of Deborah, and when I was a teacher in California, I never used to put Mount Tabor on my tests. But then I started teaching at Central Catholic, and every morning I drove over Mount Tabor from uh, Highway 205 to get to Central Catholic, and I thought I might as well throw it on the test. Um, Mount Tabor is where Deborah, the prophetess, the judge, um, tells the general, Barak, um, ironically, that he should go out and fight the Canaanites, and Barak is not too happy about the idea unless Deborah goes with him, and she agrees to go with him as well. 
So I'll throw a Mount Tabor on there and I will make sure to add a Southeast Portland reference. Uh, by the way, not many cities in the United States have extinct volcanoes within their city limits, and Portland is one of them. Uh, Mount of Olives and Mount Zion we will talk about later, and it's possible that I will put Mount Carmel on the test, but I haven't decided yet. Again, you won't have to identify where those are on the map, um, just why each of them is significant. On the map that you did in the FLIP 8 assignment, I did point out where Jericho and Jerusalem are, and those will be things that you'll have to identify on the map, but with the five cities on the right, you also under need to understand the significance of each of those cities. So I'll begin with Jericho which is the first city that the Israelites conquer when they come into the Promised Land under Joshua. Again, archaeological evidence doesn't really support the idea that Jericho was destroyed and in the time that the Israelites would have been coming into the Promised Land. Um, there is evidence that the Israelites or that people settled in, in the land of Canaan at that time and in some cases burn cities to the ground, uh, but Jericho doesn't really fit that description. What's significant about Jericho is that it's symbolic. It's the first city that the Israelites take when they go into the Promised Land. And is, uh, Jericho is also one of the very first cities that the modern state of Israel handed over to the Palestinian Authority um, in, accord, in accordance with certain treaties that have been made. And again, I've spoken about this in class a lot. The conflict that was taking place in the time of the judges, the, in the time of David, and the conflict that's taking place in that same area today is, it's a little scary how many echoes there are. And if you are a um, very, very intense Jew who does not want to give up any land to the Palestinians, the symbolic, uh, the symbolism of giving Jericho to the Palestinian Authority feels like, you know, now we're just going to give the whole land to them. And if you're a Palestinian who thinks that there should be no Jews in the Promised Land, then the symbolism of Jericho being handed over uh, carries with it the exact opposite symbolism. Now, now we're on our way, now we can drive them out. And again, I've said this many times that most people in modern Israel and Palestine, Palestine, most Christians, Muslims, Jews, most Israelis, most Palestinians want to get along with each other. And there are people on the fringes of both sides of the conflict or multiple sides of the conflict. It's almost too complex to explain. Um, people on the extremes get riled up about places like Jericho and Hebron and the idea of giving up even a few inches or a few feet or one city um, to the other side is untenable and so um, violence breaks out and then even reasonable people in the middle um, wanna, um, don't want to work for peace anymore. Um, Jerusalem is uh, the capital of Israel, and on your map, it's right where the West Bank and the state of Israel come together. I'm going to talk about that more in class and talk about the significance of it and King David. Samaria we'll talk about later, and Bethlehem and Nazareth we will also talk about later. I will offer you um, one correction. In a previous slide, I said that Gideon was described in Flip 8 and that Joshua was described in Flip 8. Um, they were both actually described in Flip 7. And then Samuel, I described in Flip 9 and in class, and you took a quiz on him. And Saul, we also discussed in class. And I'm going to leave it at that.